asylum. And if we might do so, think about the victim of the hurricane's fall.
Madam Mayor, Honorable Commission members, my name is Jim Hinckley. I am a citizen, a proud citizen of Pittsburgh, and uh, <coughs> I've lived here uh, since 1981. And in my present situation, I live in Creekside Apartments, which is over behind St. Bart's Church in the cemetery. And I am here to talk to you about uh, the condition of the apartments and also the relationship that we have with, with uh, the management. Uh, about 40, 45 years ago, uh, Creekside Apartments was the premier apartment location in this town. Excellent design uh, and uh, great landscaping. If you haven't been there, it's worth visiting. However, in recent years, the condition of the apartments has uh, deteriorated and many of the units are seedy if you understand what that means. And um, the uh, residents at uh, Creekside Apartments are mostly retired people and also uh, uh, people of, of lesser means than, than the main population. We are, uh, we are uh, in the process now of uh, trying to get the management, which is prestige management out of Greensboro, to do some uh, remedial work and to do some uh, work that will upgrade the condition of the apartments. Uh, we have been basically unsuccessful in getting uh, prestige management to listen to our needs and to respond to uh, the, the issues that we have with our apartments. We have uh, had some police uh, policing problems there, uh, which you probably know about, and we have uh, uh, situations where the apartments are becoming uh, in my case, uh, anyway, and then in some other people's uh, situations, they're almost unlivable. Now, I live there because I like the landscaping and I like the architectural design. Uh, and I've, I've been lived there since for about five years now. And uh, the uh, apartment I live in uh, has torn carpeting. It has ceilings that are peeling off and dropping to the floor. Uh, the apartment I live in too has some leaks and uh, the air conditioning and the uh, heating is uh, in need of upgrading. And uh, there are a number of other issues that uh, standing water in the hallways, uh, among others, that I've uh, communicated with uh, prestige management and asked them to come and take care of those issues that I have. And a number of other, and there are representatives here from Creekside also, uh, a number of other residents too are having comparable problems with uh, that I have. And uh, we are becoming more frustrated and more uh, unable to deal with our situations because the management is non-responsive. They listen to our phone calls and they do uh, send people out from time to time to take care of the issues. My, the drains in my bathroom, for instance, I forgot to mention that. They're, they're not clogged, but they're, they're very, very slow. 
But these issues are uh, are really uh, beginning to bug us pretty badly. Jim, if I may interrupt, at our last meeting we had several speakers uh, with respect to the very same problems. We <coughs> even had uh, someone bring in a piece of the ceiling tile that had fallen. And then the following Thursday after that, you all were having the homeowners uh, or yes. apartment uh, uh, dwellers meeting. Unfortunately, we were not able to attend that night. But in the meantime, our town attorney, Mr. Messick, has let us know that there is a code of sorts, a building code of sorts, although it's in severe need of, of uh, updating and, and making it more inclusive. But um, uh, if we could work together with the homeowners yeah. group and, and with this newfound information from Mr. Messick, mm -hmm. um, I, I do remember that I believe it was Mary Phillips <coughs> Horn said yes. that, um, that they did respond fairly nicely to political pressure and we might be able to, uh, to provide that for you. Um, would that kind of thing be satisfactory? Uh, we've been very fortunate to have uh, Commissioner Bonnets uh, meet with us uh, a couple times and to talk to us about the things that we can do. Now this board has been excellent in doing things about the infrastructure, water, sewer, and over the years. Uh, there were some dire situations as I recall, as I remember. Uh, but uh, the board also has a responsibility of looking out for the health and welfare of its, of its citizens. And uh, that might be something new for y'all, uh, a new area to get in, in addition to the infrastructure problems. So uh, uh, I am here to request your applying your political weight uh, to uh, help us take care of ourselves and get a response from uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the owners of the, uh, the apartments. We uh, uh, have requested them over and over and over again. And uh, we haven't got, we've had response, take no action. So anyway, I, I appreciate your hearing. Thank you. We're very interested and I'm glad that that John Bonnets has been able to meet with you yes. um, and I fully intend to in the future and so let's see what we can do together. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you, Jim. Mayor Perry, is there a possibility that the town could send the uh, uh, landlord a letter regarding this problem? With yeah, the, uh, I think that the town letter is a possible commission. I think that would be very important. <coughs> Um, I'll be glad to draft something and then run it by um, Mr. Messick. Paul, would that be? Sure, go ahead. Okay. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, addressing you this evening as a member of the Board of Directors of Main Street Pittsburgh and speaking on their behalf. Uh, we had another productive meeting uh, just last uh, uh, Wednesday uh, at the Town County Department, and we are all very excited about the direction that we are heading with Main Street Pittsburgh. And one of the items that we have discussed at some length is the reuse of existing buildings in the Main Street District and by extension throughout the downtown area. 
And we believe that it is in the town's best interest to encourage reuse and redevelopment of the buildings in downtown, particularly if we can attract entrepreneurs that will invest in locally owned destinations such as unique retail shops and restaurants. We truly believe that if the retail businesses are at the heart of our downtown, if it's going to prosper and stay healthy in the years ahead. One method for the town to consider in addressing this encouragement of the reuse of our downtown buildings might be to look at the water and sewer impact fees. According to the budget, the fees are designed to compensate the citizens of Pittsburgh for their investment in water and wastewater treatment facilities with the fee to be based on the volume of capacity needed according to the North Carolina Administrative Code. And while this is a remark reasonable goal, perhaps the town ought to be able to take a look at that and see what else could be done. For example, a 100-seat restaurant such as the one currently being built on Salisbury Street would be charged at an impact fee of $70,200. The fee is based on that 1755 per gallon times 4,000 gallons per day that the state code stipulates, $40 per seat, 40 gallons per seat. And even with a slight adjustment for the previous use of the building, the fee is still $62,741. This is a daunting fee for some haunting fee for someone trying to create a new restaurant in downtown Pittsburgh. We recommend that the town make an adjustment to the access fee, which could perhaps be one of the following ideas or a combination of them. The town utilized the historic use of water for similar business types as the guide for the fee. For example, if restaurants downtown, such as the Roadhouse and other establishments, are historically only using 1,000 gallons of water per day, that could be a rational basis to look at the fee. Or the town could base the fee on the size of the water meter, or the town could keep the same system it uses and simply lower the impact access fees. The town could explore policy offering of rebate fees to incentivize redevelopment and implement of and redevelopment of existing buildings in town. Uh, the, the board of Main Street truly believes that our downtown area requires and needs viable, vibrant retail businesses as we move into the future. In any case, we appreciate your time and support the town has provided to Main Street, and I hope that you'll be able to work out some policy change that will help with this redevelopment issue. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ellen Brooks.
120 years. So we spend the 100,000, we're on the moratorium, we spend the 100,000. We get this building uh, situated in a way that um, it's easier for the staff to work here and in the other buildings that, that our staff works. I think we have about 42 people on the town staff. And I think maybe 10 or 12 or so are out in the fields. So that leaves about 30. So, um, I lost my train of thought for a second. Back up. So, as to getting people settled in those two locations and having them work together, that was kind of where you were headed. Thank you so much. Um, gone from my brain. But let, let's, I'm just going to re-say what I've said. If you all will consider, seriously consider a moratorium, uh, consider up in that 33,500 33, annual budget that we have that we're spending right now to rent the space at Chatham Market. And you know, when we rent space from Chatham Market, Chatham Market pays taxes on it, so it's good for the, for the town. Up that to 100,000, while there's a moratorium. Oh, I know what I'm going to say. And I think maybe we need another engineer. You know, I said that's in our budget. Our good, yeah, good, because I've been listening to all this. <coughs> it seems like we're short an engineer. So we could look at spending money instead of the 12 million on the town on the town hall. We could look at customer service to the customers that we're going to have, um, rather than where they go to get the service rather than where they go to get the service. So would y'all consider a moratorium? Let us, uh, first of all, would you put your comments in writing? Yeah. And that would help us, and then we'll place it on the agenda upcoming. And okay. That would be excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Paula. That closes out citizens' matters. Um, hey, Perry, I have one thing. Yeah. Uh, uh -huh. uh, Mr. Matt. When, if I'm not mistaken, last meeting, Mr. Jones, did you not discuss some of this regarding these fees and all like this at the last meeting that we were looking into, like going back into the history of some of these buildings, what they were? I think there was a question from the audience as to if there was a more intense use than the past, the previous use, what use would be mm -hmm. used, mm -hmm. and I said the most intense use as possible. Um, if we can identify what that is, then we would use that. There, there is, from what I understand, a house bill, I don't remember the name of uh, the number of it, but <coughs> is going to mandate some uh, fairly severe uh, revision of, of Cost. Uh, so I think that that is going to be um, something that we're going to be doing upcoming, uh, and I believe that uh, that's going to be on our agenda on those costs for uh, applications and uh, zoning and all things like that, <laughs> as well as infrastructure. Um, I, uh, under updates, I have only attended one meeting <coughs> on the 7th of September, which was a Triangle J Council of Government Mayors and Chairs meeting. I was very pleased that uh, our own Jim Crawford, Chair of our um, County Commission, uh, is, uh, uh, is chairing that group now. And we had a speaker from the Rural Urban uh, Group talking about the urban and rural divide and how we can bring um, people together <coughs> recognizing common needs and common um, functions. So, um, is there, are there any meetings that um, other members would like to speak about? Well, I can uh, add to what Jim uh, said about the Main Street uh, meeting that I attended last Wednesday. And we had a representative from the state there to advise us on how to go about modifying the Main Street boundary. So it's 
desired. And one of the ways to do that would be simply for this board to modify that boundary. Uh, it would have to meet certain criteria. Um, and then we could send it on to the state and they would acknowledge that. Uh, our boundary is seven years old, six years old. And when we revisited it, we thought maybe some of the properties didn't make sense to be there. And some that were absent, maybe it was so the group is going to look at modifying the boundary and possibly bring it to the board. Mm -hmm. for that Anything else? Or climate change? I have not received an update from the climate change meeting last week. And I was not able to attend. All right. Now, to the PBA, the next PBA meeting is this Wednesday at 9 a.m. for the next. Affordable housing. The, trying, the Chatham County commissioners are now going to ask the Triangle J to review for affordable housing and come up with ideas for affordable, not just rental this time, but for purchasing homes. And they are asking members of the public as well as someone from each one of the councils from Scholar City, from the town of Pittsburgh, and the city of, and the town of Gosden to be a part of that as well. And they're also asking members, uh, anyone who are citizens, if they would like to participate in that, as on that committee, they, you are certainly welcome. And that was actually in the paper. When I saw that, I didn't know if you'd be willing to continue to serve as on behalf of the town of Pittsburgh. I don't know if I can. Okay. Well, I'm sure you can. Okay. Well, thank you. 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 Or whether I can do that. But if no one else on the board can do that, I would be happy to talk about it. Let's then do our ceremonial uh, aspect of our um, agenda the addition of the resolution by the Board of Commissioners, uh, and it reads as follows Whereas 16 years ago today, our nation suffered the unfathomable loss of over 3,000 lives in the attack on the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York, the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., and near Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Whereas this is a time to reflect on that tragic loss, which tore across the nation and across the boundaries of national origin, race, economic status of the people in the towers, the Pentagon, and on Flight 93, and out of which our nation came together to recommit to diligence and watchfulness on matters of security. And whereas, although the loss was tragically personal to many, it was also monumental to our nation and to us all, citizens, innocent bystanders, first responders, and firefighters, to make us strive even more diligently for protection and peace in the many areas of our lives and throughout our community and country. Therefore, be it resolved that the Town Board of Commissioners of the Town of Pittsburgh reflects on and recognizes the hope for the Town of Pittsburgh as we remember this occasion, and as the Board recommits to strive for and achieve diligence, peace, and security in the protection of our government, our constituents, our employees, and for the benefit of the people of the Town of Pittsburgh. This resolution was approved at the regular meeting of the Board on September 11, 2017, and shall be entered into the public records of the town of Pittsburgh, indicating the board's commitment to this remembrance. Is there a motion to approve the resolution? Seven. Second. Moved by <coughs> Bette Wilson Foley, seconded by Jay Farrell. Those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed. Thank you. The next matter is uh, under new business. Uh, Jim, I believe we have you back for the um, ABC. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I'm now talking to you as chair of the uh, Pittsburgh ABC Board. And so on behalf of uh, Hugh Harrington and Ned Kelly, my cover board members, I wanted to do a couple, three things. One, to give you an update on how we uh, got through the fiscal year, what uh, those results look like, to talk a little bit about our five and 20 year plan update, and then to uh, ask you to uh, approve a resolution concerning our working capital. So at the end of this past fiscal year, we had another very good year. We had revenues of 1.4 million, 
and a profit of 668000 And both of those numbers are going to increase over last year. Now, in the previous couple of years, we were growing at double-digit rates, 10 to 11 to 12 percent. This year, we're back into the single digits, but still, uh, still growing quite well. Uh, mixed beverage sales, however, have gotten to be just even with last year. So that's something that's of a little concern to us in that it's, it's not growing. So we're keeping an eye on, on that situation. And uh, not only is it a reflection, perhaps, of how our restaurants are doing here in Pittsburgh, but also from a board perspective, uh, that's a more profitable sale for us than uh, uh, retail. Uh, we had a very good audit at the end of the year with no problems to report. And we were able to move our employee health insurance program into the state local employees program. And that provides more stability, uh, better benefits, and actually a lower cost to both the employee and to the ABC board. So we're pleased to have been able to do that. And we were also able to enact, finally, the final piece of our endeavor over the last few years to make the Pittsburgh ABC store a very good place to work with actually some benefits. And we started, as you might remember, where there were no benefits, no vacation time, no sick leave, no health insurance, no retirement plan. And I'm proud to tell you that we have fixed that. We now have uh, gained entrance into the state retirement plan for our employees. So uh, we're very happy about that. Now, in terms of the 5- and 20-year plan update, two years ago I advised you that we were beginning to work on a 5-year plan where we projected a new store within that five-year plan, and then a additional store in the 20-year plan, and of course that being dependent on the growth that we expected to occur primarily from Chatham Park. Our current five-year plan still has that as a valid uh, set of assumptions. However, we have moved the idea of a new store to the latter end of that five-year period based upon where things are right now. The plan still calls for a continued downtown presence, and I want to say publicly that our current facility remains very viable, and we have no current plans to replace it anytime in the near future. But this year, we will perform an analysis of the impact of expansion on our current store. That is, if we open another one, how much business will it draw from the existing store? What will that do to our revenue and cost structure? We're going to do a cost-risk analysis on our current store, that is, what it's going to cost to maintain it over the next few years. We know we've got some heating and cooling, we're going to have to do that sort of thing, versus what it's worth, versus what something else might cost us. And we're going to do a cost-benefit analysis and the idea of using the current store as the warehouse for any projected new store. We simply don't like the idea of paying retail prices for storage. And since we have lots of room for storage in our existing building, we, it may turn out better to serve that new store out of our warehouse than the old store. So we're going to be looking at that. Um, at the end of 2014-15 fiscal year, I came to you and suggested and asked you to approve a situation where we could take the amount of working capital over and above what we're allowed to keep without your approval and work out a 60-40 split with you, the 60% being retained and the 40% going to the town. And we would put that money towards savings for this new facility that we're talking about and upgrades that were necessary to the old facility. And at the end of 15-16, I made a similar request to you and you again approved it graciously. So for those two fiscal years, we were allowed to retain $117,000 and provide the town with 68000 I'm making the same request again tonight for fiscal 16 and 17. If approved, we would retain 92,494 and provide 61,663 to the town. For the three fiscal years, we would have retained then 209,000 and provided 129,000 to the town. And that's, of course, over and above our quarterly distributions. Three year retention of 209,539 would put us exactly on target in our five-year plan for the amount of money that we need to put away for the expansion of our new store. So uh, that is my report. And uh, the other thing I just might mention is uh, uh, that we 
if this is approved this tonight, we will have provided during this fiscal year $99,230 to the town in total. And I almost thought of asking Faye to write a little check for the difference up to 100 <laughs> And I said, well, we'll wait that for us to break that $100,000 uh, marker for uh, for next year. So we glad to take questions. It is. I'm sorry? 5941 it is. <laughs> so I, uh, be more than happy to take questions or comments, and then I again would ask you to approve again for another year our arrangement of the working capital situation. Questions from the board? Well, I'd just like to thank Jim, Hugh, and uh, the guy who doesn't show up, Ned. Um, for all the work that you're doing. I mean, you've turned it around, you continue to grow, um, continue to provide great service to the town, obviously for the employees. Um, the, the attitude in the store is fantastic, so appreciate all of that. Thank you. And the board appreciates the support of, uh, of this board, and, uh, and our our liaison, uh, Commissioner Fioco, attends most meetings, and it's helpful to us, but we really do feel and appreciate the support of this board. Mr. Ness, I'm curious about the uh, heating and cooling analysis that you mentioned. Uh, it, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? Well, we know that we're running out of just years, that where eventually there's going to be an issue where we're going to need to uh, uh, take a look at replacing that heating and cooling unit. And so that and some other issues, we're in a very old building that's been there for a long, 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 long time. We did a remodel, uh, as you remember, a few years ago. But when we're looking at the long term of that building, and then we're looking at what it will cost to keep that building going, that's what we're looking at, including the heating and cooling, just as an example. And then we want to compare that with what would happen over that time if we uh, made some other arrangements, that is, provided another downtown location, what that would cost, what the building that we're in now and the land it sits on might be worth, so that we can be sensible about uh, where we go and, and, and what we do as we're moving forward. The board is, the ABC board is being very cautious on this business of expansion and this business of the, the store simply because we want to ensure that we are able to provide not only great service to our customers but also that we are a revenue generator for the town. I mean, I think the reason that myself and uh, Hugh Harrington and Ned Kelly are on that board is because we look at it as providing a benefit and service to the town of Pittsburgh, not only in providing a, a, a great store, but in being able to provide funds <coughs> to the town on a fairly regular basis that can be used uh, for other things without uh, taxation and that sort of thing. The reason I ask about the heating and cooling equipment is um, from our own perspective, my family is residential. Uh, we were really surprised at the tremendous amount of savings we uh, gained with new equipment, which yeah. is higher efficiency and much greater uh, performance, much greater comfort. So I'm guessing that the equipment in that building is old enough yeah. that you're also going to see a really great leap in efficiency and dollar savings. <coughs> and I also want to commend uh, the programs that Duke Energy has uh, for rebates. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure what the ABC's legal status is, but I would guess that the organization would qualify them for their commercial incentives. Yes. So thank you, thank you, Commissioner. When we remodeled the store, and, uh, we had the initial expectation of our heating and cooling costs going up because of, you know we took that false ceiling out. Well, it turns out we actually saved a ton of money because the return error system was just not working. And by opening that up and with the tucks being properly set up, we had proper return air and actually ended up saving money. But I have no doubt you're correct that the new equipment would be a, a huge savings in that respect. Thank you. Are there other questions for Jim from the board? I don't have a question, but thank you, Mr. Nance. I appreciate all that you've done and the board has done in reference to that and the funds that you all have given to the town. Well, tonight, if you approve this resolution, I have three checks. One for $61,663 to the town, 
another for $10,270, which is the quarterly distribution, and then another for $1,186 to the law enforcement. And is there a motion to affect the uh, retention of the 60% working capital? So moved. Second. Moved by John Bonnet, seconded by Michael Fioco. Those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those aye. Opposed. Thank you very much. And now I'm going to present you with these three checks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Next on our agenda, since we're skipping the same tech cluster, uh, is the number three, Southwest Shores Conservancy. Catherine? Catherine Benjamin. Thank you. And um, you have the presentation? I think Alice got it on Friday afternoon at some point. I'm trying to dig it out of here. Okay. Um, I'm not sure Thursday. where that title came from. Um, the Southwest Shores report is an assessment that I was involved in about, I don't know, 12 years ago or something. Um, you know, it's been around for a while. Um, I'm actually here to talk about the recommendations from the Conservation Ordinance Review Committee that came out of the Planning Tools Project. Um, so anyways, I, I appreciate being invited to come and speak to you guys tonight. Um, and this is about a project that we did, um, we completed two years ago. And actually, we had a work session um, three years ago in October where we went over these recommendations. And so the presentation that I'm going to give this evening is essentially that same presentation that I gave two years ago. And um, what I was asked to do was come and talk about open space, about tree protection, about stormwater, um, anything that could relate to those um, areas. And um, this project, the Planning Tools for Pittsburgh, um, we worked with a, a committee that we formed and came up with recommendations for tree protection and for um, a natural resource conservation ordinance. So that's what I'm going to talk about. This slide here shows all the project partners that worked on that project. Um, this was a project that was funded by the Forestry Service, the Town of Pittsburgh approved being used as a demo for developing these um, these ordinances that these recommendations came out of. Um, so they were part of the project, but we had a number of other project partners too. And these are all people, all organizations that worked on the project. They're not just supporting the project, but they actually the work went into the project. Um, my my primary role was um, facilitation, and then also um, I did a lot of the the analysis that went into the project. You have a, a remark. Oh, I do. Oh, excellent. Then I don't have to bug you. Okay. Okay. <coughs> I have to learn how to use it. Okay. So, like I said, I was asked to talk about open space. Um, tree protection, stormwater, and so I thought first, um, there's two slides that I added to this, and this is one of them. First, I kind of talk, make that connection. So typically, when we see development these days, this is what we see. We, we this, I don't know how many of you recognize this site. I, I <coughs> don't know this site. It's near Woods Charter School and Margaret Pollard. Um, this used to be a forest up until, I don't know, six years ago or something. Um, and when it was to be developed, all that forest was just completely cleared and uh, the site was graded. And um, we, there was construction um, ponds put in. Um, but this is what happens with typical development still these days, is that the site is cleared, um, it's graded, um, the soils are compacted, and that um, completely destroys any ability of the site to deal with the stormwater. It basically becomes an impervious site because its um, topsoil is removed, <coughs> the canopy is removed. Um, this is a, from a study that, you know, check my notes, um, a study that was done by uh, Dr. Barrett Keyes, who is a well-known 
soil scientist and urban landscape planner in um, North Carolina. And he did this study in Charlotte. And what it does is it looks at and compares the forest, a forest site to other sites that have been cleared and they have de different um, layers of soil left. But basically it shows that the infiltration rate with a forested site is 14 times more at least than a site that's been cut and compacted, such as the site that we were just looking at. And so I, one of the points I wanted to make is we're talking about tree protection and we're talking about um, open space. And when we're talking about this sort of infiltration, you're getting this sort of infiltration from a natural forest, from a forest that hasn't been cleared and replanted. You're getting this sort of infiltration from open space that's natural open space that has not been turned into open space. That, I mean, open space has a lot of definitions right now, and they're all appreciated. But um, when you're connecting open space and tree canopy to stormwater, you need to make sure that you're looking at a protected tree canopy, not a replanted tree canopy. And you're looking at open space that still has that, that top soil there. It, you have to go and look at the, um, I went and looked at the, um, the paper this came out of, and those are just the indications of the different types that you did. So this is, this is pulled from, from, a, um, from a presentation that was done on, um, by um, Dr. Barrett Key, and that's how he labeled the different types. I also had that question. I, I looked into it. So, now this is the presentation that some of you guys saw two years ago, but you probably don't remember that much. Um, anyway, so out of the planning tools project, um, we developed, well, we worked on um, two uh, model ordinances. The Natural Resource Conservation Ordinance, which was developed by the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission and by Duke University. We also worked on developing, um, it actually was developed as part of this project, um, a guide for tree protection ordinances for North Carolina. So this is a guide that the um, North Carolina Forest Service is using for many small towns in, in the state. Um, so we took both of those model ordinances and um, we formed a committee based on town recommendations of who needs to be on that committee and went through those model ordinances and developed recommendations to meet the ordinances for the town of Pittsburgh. Um, these are the people that were on that committee and basically the goal was to develop recommendations on what would have to be done to implement or ways to implement those two ordinances, not that they have to be done. Okay. Uh, this is a slide that, um, actually I put this slide in at the work session and maybe I should have taken it out. This is a slide that shows all the things that were in your packet when we had the work session. Mm -hmm. What actually you were given, I think, for today in addition to this presentation is just the Conservation Ordinance Review Committee's recommendations for the, the next, so the number, is this? number three and four. Um, but all these other um, materials are, are on a website for the Channel Conservation Partnership, and I'll share that with you at the end of the presentation. So you can always access that. So we're going to start by talking about the recommendations that came out. Um, for the um, for tree protection ordinance. And so the first recommendation that we came up with, um, and, and actually I should mention this first, gosh, I have. Uh, this this um, Conservation Ordinance Review Committee, it met for six months for, I think, every, every other week 
three hours. It, 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 I mean, this was a long discussion to come up with these recommendations um, and a lot of volunteer hours that went into this. So anyways, uh, the first thing that we came up for the tree ordinance is that we wanted to um, recognize that to actually do free tree protection and to have a tree protection program, um, you're really talking about more than just a tree protection ordinance. You're talking about a tree protection ordinance, a street, and or a landscape ordinance. You're talking about, um, at least we were recommending that you have a tree technical um, manual. And um, if you think about the uh, stormwater additional element that Chatham Park has come up with, they have a stormwater technical manual that goes with that um, program that they're proposing. This is very similar with a, um, a tree technical manual you can um, you can make changes to that and updates to that much more easily than you can to the actual ordinance. Um, it's more of a working document. Um, we recommended that you establish a tree board and that this will um, eventually apply to be um, part of tree city. So the actual recommendation for the rest of the recommendation ordinance, I mean, document that you have in front of you are actually looking at that first one, the tree <coughs> protection ordinance. And these are the sections that the guide suggested being in a tree protection ordinance. Um, and what I'm going to look at quickly here with you um, is section two and section three on applicability and tree protection standards. Now there are recommendations in that document that you have in front of you um, for each one of those sections. Um, but you know, I, I suspect you don't want me here forever. So, so we're going to talk about that. So first of all, for applicability, that is where actually does this apply? And this is one of the things that we have a lot of discussion about. It's really important um, to understand actually where the tree protection ordinance is going to apply. And obviously, it is to protect existing canopy, um, specifically during um, new development. Okay? And um, so it's important that it applies prior to the planning process, that you identify what your existing canopy is and you um, and those protections are put in place before the property begins to be developed. Um, and one of the things that the, uh, the committee was very concerned about was avoiding having um, sites clear cut. Um, this is something that happens um, occasionally where uh, land will be treated as timberland and then clear cut and then come back and develop. And, um, and that can destroy um, a, a piece of property um, as far as how it deals with stormwater and um, its natural resources. So uh, one of the things that we recommended um, was that you use uh, the language that is in one of the, that's in actually more still um, tree protection ordinance or to have some language in the tree protection ordinance that makes this, um, keeps this from happening. And the language in Morrisville, what they do is they say, um, once um, uh, a site has been identified that it's going to be um, uh, developed, then the um, development, if, if it is cleared before the planning process begins, then that site has to wait for three years before they start actually developing that site. So, they, so you can put restrictions um, in to, to keep that from happening. And, and I have in the document that you have there exactly the wording that was used for that. Um, another thing is that um, sites that are too small should be exempted from, um, from the uh, 
tree protection ordinances. And uh, here these are sites that where they're being developed, a small piece of it's being developed. And the exemption that we came up with based on disco um, discussions with the um, town engineer and with all the committee members, um, many of who are, you know, work on um, tree protection, was the disturbance areas of 7,000 square feet are <coughs> going to be exempt um, from protection. And I did the math today just to remind myself that's 0.16 acres. Uh, if you look at Chatham Park's additional elements, they're suggesting two acres. So this is a big difference. So the second section that I wanted to talk about was the actual tree protection standards. Um, there are a number of ways to do tree protection. Um, the way that we were suggesting and the way the UDO and Chatham Parks is suggesting is actually having a minimum tree canopy requirement. And we looked at all the towns within North Carolina that have tree protection ordinances and at what their minimum tree protection um, standards were. And um, we also looked at what the town of Pittsburgh's current um, tree coverage is. So what their current canopy, your current canopy, as of 2013, when um, we were doing this project and we had a land cover change analysis done as part of the planning tools project, the canopy for the um, town limits of Pittsburgh is 53% current, well, in 2013 it was, 53%. Um, I took that data set and I um, did an analysis to figure out what a dent, what the downtown um, tree canopy was, and it was 14%. So we looked at that, plus we looked at what other towns were using, um, and came up with these minimal tree requirements: 15% um, for a downtown district. 30% for multifamily and commercial, 40% institutional mixed use, and other. And this is very typical. Um, uh, let's see, I think um, Greensboro is 38% tree canopy coverage is what they're aiming for. Um, these are the amounts that are being used in Chapel Hill, except for the downtown district. And then the minimum tree, the minimum canopy coverage below which is based on lot size for um, single and two-family residential, that is what Chapel Hill uses for their um, little canopy cover, if you look at their tree ordinance. So that gives you, um, you know, I, I, you want to, I would think that you would want to at least match what other towns in the same eco, um, the, uh, the same eco region are, are using. So other towns in the Piedmont. Okay, so the other part of the tree um, standards, the tree protection standards was preservation of specimen trees and um, clusters of trees. And clusters of trees, once a cluster of trees was determined, um, that cluster should have a minimum area of 500 square feet. And so that's something um, that came out of talking to the Forest Service and to the Wildlife Resource Commission. So I know that you've been looking at some of those buffers um, that should be included in your tree protection area for your UDO and for the Chatham Parks, and, and that gives you a number to maybe compare that to, that tree cluster area. That's, um, so that's not on the slide, but that is in, in that document that you have, um, that minimum. So the other thing is a specimen tree. Um, and so in addition to protecting canopy and clusters of trees, you also want to protect specific specimen trees, and this is something that, I mean, it's in all the ordinances that you're looking at. It's also the thing that I most heard about from the beginning when people were talking about 
uh, protection of trees in Pittsburgh is people were very attached to specific trees and how can we make sure that those trees are just are protected and not taken down without consideration. So um, specimen trees, any healthy living pine tree that has a trunk diameter of 18 inches or more at um, diameter at breast height. Okay. Um, for other trees, that diameter would be 12 inches. Um, and then um, I ha we also uh, recommended a trunk diameter of breast height of 6 inches or more for species of trees that are native to North Carolina that are in this list. Now this is a list of some of our best love understory trees that we would love to continue seeing in our, um, in our environment. Um, if you look at the uh, tree protection ordinance that is in the UDO, they have exactly this definition for specimen trees, except they leave off that last bit. So in the way the UDO is written, you would lose <coughs> these trees because these trees do not get to 12 inches, okay, in general. You may be able to go find a dogwood that has a 12 inch diameter, but it's highly unlikely. So if you want to be protecting your understory trees, then you need to add, add um, that to your um, your definition for specimen trees. Okay. So now we're going to switch gears and talk about the model natural resource conservation ordinance. Now this is a model ordinance that the Duke University and the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission has been developing for the Green Growth Toolbox. Um, we were not the first town that they used this on, um, this model ordinance. Um, it was modeled on a couple other towns, um, but they certainly refined it in working with us. But with the, um, what we did to actually, okay, let me step back a second. So what I've shown here is the different sections, again, that are in the um, model ordinance, okay? And I have checked off the three sections I'm going to talk about. The recommendations that are in your document are for all uh, six of the sections. Um, so we're going to talk about the Natural Resource Conservation Overlay District, the standards, and the definitions, which are kind of the meat of the, of the ordinance. So to talk about the Overlay District, we first have to step back and and look very quickly at how an overlay district is developed. And this is using the steps that are given in the Green Growth Toolbox that the North Carolina Wildlife Resource Commission um, has developed. It's also um, based on the North Carolina Natural Heritage Program Conservation Planning Tool. And so in that planning tool, they have um, this biodiversity and wildlife habitat analysis, and we completed that for Pittsburgh. And this gives you the results of that analysis. And there is um, one of the uh, summary reports that you don't have in front of you this time, but you did last time, uh, gives you a complete summary of all the layers that go into that analysis. Um, and if anybody <coughs> needs to have that again, just let me know and I can get it for you. You can go find it on Chatham Conservation Partnerships website. But anyways, what is shown here is that anything that has a conservation value of one to 10 has conservation value, okay? 10 being the highest. Anything that's white with no conservation value has no conservation value that um, resources that went into this. So you can look at this, you can see that Pittsburgh has a wealth of conservation uh, natural resources. Um, so, and the black actually is impervious surfaces. So to do this analysis, you basically 
need to knock out anything that's already developed because you're not going to be conserving that. So I did this analysis for, Pit, for Siler City as well, and they came back and they said, we want to be retrofitting and revitalizing our downtown and turning it into green space. They had me go back and look at those impervious surfaces and figure out what they could do to bring green space in and get rid of impervious surface. So that would be an interesting thing to do. I was impressed. I did not come up with that. They did. So, but that's not what we do here. Um, so when we looked at this and we um, shared this with town staff, they said, okay, for the conservation overlay district, let's look at um, conservation values from five to 10. Let's start with that. So those are higher values. Okay, so this is what it looks like from five to 10. Okay. And um, just looking at this, I can remember that has some of the larger forests in it, that has the natural heritage areas in it, it has a lot of the waterways that are shown in blue. Um, so that's primarily what you're looking at there. Um, and this, this map here in the corner there, we actually did the analysis for all the seven watersheds that drain um, Pittsburgh. So then we cut out and clipped it just to Pittsburgh side so that we wouldn't actually lose any of those layers. Okay. So, taking into account that analysis, okay. and then also, um, also town staff said, let's um, put uh, a thousand foot buffer on the, on the Hall River. So we also included that. Actually, that was just, that might be a typo. I think it might actually be 2,000 feet. But anyway, we put the buffer on the Fall River. Um, and then we went back and looked at specific natural resources. We looked at um, unfragmented forests, and we looked at isolated wetlands, and we included those two. You can see um, a number of almost circles there. That's where we have isolated wetlands. Um, there are a number of isolated wetlands in those more um, in those bigger areas, but they're included. Um, so this would be this was the overlay district that we um, that the conservation ordinance review committee uh, recommended, and uh, basically it has it has we tried to in addition to um, protecting the natural resources. We try to connect them all using the riparian areas because this is partly for um, biodiversity and wildlife habitat so that the view have those natural corridors and the, and the riparian areas lended themselves to this. And one of the things that's really cool about this, if you step back and actually um, look outside of Pittsburgh's ETJ with all the managed land that is around Pittsburgh because of the Hall River and Jordan Lake, all of these areas are connected, except for that one that is um, the Leffler Forest that's over there to the west. So that there is actually a way to go from one area to the other through natural habitat, which is very cool. Um, and so, you know, Pittsburgh has a lot of that already now. Um, and then we identified basically um, primary conservation hubs the uh, water supply area that basically protects um, Brooks Creek, which is the creek that drains directly to Pittsburgh's water supply behind the dam, the Robeson Creek slopes, um, Stinking Creek area down there um, in the bottom, uh, Camp Creek headwaters. Camp Creek is your um, highest uh, uh, water resource as far as um, it has the best water quality in the town. Um, and Robeson Creek, and I'm sure most of you guys know, is impaired for benthic <coughs> life, or benthic <coughs> aquatic life. And Camp Creek is, is in good shape. It's the one creek that's in really good shape. So we were looking to protect um, that forest that's around um, Camp Creek. Can you please highlight Camp Creek? Yeah, can I? Can I um, 
It has a much smaller list, but it has um, a very good list. So um, there, there will probably be places that I would recommend be put back in, but um, it, uh, it, they do a good job. I cannot, not off the top of my head. Okay. Um, and, and one of the things that they did in that that's interesting is that they took the biodiversity and wildlife habitat assessment, not the one we did, but the, the state does it for, for the state, and they included some of those rankings and they said anything that's above, I think, an eight, I think, I'm just remembering, um, my memory is kind of sketchy sometimes, so I think they said eight and above. Um, be included as a uh, natural resource. So that, that was an interesting way to do it. So I would have to compare exactly what is in the state's biodiversity and wildlife habitat that's ranked at eight and above, and to be sure about that. Or I can answer that. We need to bring it to the work session. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, this is uh, my, my summary page here. Um, Anyone who's interested in looking at this anymore, uh, this is the website, Chatham Conservation Wikispaces.com project summary. Um, if you go and Google Chatham Conservation Partnership Wiki, you'll find this page. Um, it's also in the presentation. Okay. So yes, I will come to. I, I plan to come in case you guys have anything to ask me on the 21st. And I, I appreciate, I know it's a long presentation. Um, I, I was bad and didn't ask how much time I had. So. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Catherine, thank you so much for your time. I want to recognize that you're giving your time and uh, as, as a professional uh, with a tremendous amount of expertise and experience in this. I greatly appreciate the time that you invested and the time you continue to invest in helping remind us of the work that you've done and what well, the, the, the larger committee did. Yeah, the, I, it, we had an amazing committee. committee that worked on this and they put so much time and effort into it. Um, it, was, it, was a, it was a great group to work with. Um, so, yeah, and I, I want to see that work used. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next agenda item is the preliminary subdivision plat review for Collector Road A. Victoria Vale will lead us to this for Chatham Park Section 5. Okay. Uh, we have Thompson Street subdivision. Uh, Chatham Development 1 Incorporated has submitted plans for review. The location of the proposed subdivision is north of Thompson Street and east of Pittsburgh Fire Tower Road. The proposal is to subdivide 26.9 acres into 29 lots. The lots average 11,794 square feet in size. The land is zoned PDD. The Pittsburgh subdivision regulations require streets to be bordered by sidewalks on both sides. However, this developer is requesting an exception for the modified cul-de-sac here, which our ordinance classifies as a loop street. Um, staff is recommending approval of the exemption request and preliminary plat. The planning board reviewed these plans at their meeting on July 5th. The board recommended approval of the preliminary plat and the sidewalk exemption for the loop street. <coughs> Any questions for Victoria? No, no questions for Victoria. Uh -huh. um, I had a pretty good correspondence today with the staff and the developer on numerous questions that I had about this. And so I still have some that remain um, that I need clarity on. I don't know if that will be uh, are, are finished here? I, I see all kinds of red marks on Michael. <coughs> Michael's 
you want the engineer? Who do you, who do you want to answer the question?
so we went back and looked and, and, and made some adjustments. The first layout we had, you know, we had roads and crossing this natural drainage area back here that you're identifying um, between those lots. Uh, we came back, exactly, we came back and redid the lot layout. So rather than encroaching in that, we've got lots backing up to that natural drainage area. Um, so part of the reason we're putting this 40 to 45 foot drainage easement on there is to, to protect and preserve that. We're not going in there proposing to clear that and pipe it like you would in a lot of places. That, that's the easy answer. We would come in there and pipe that, uh, have a VMP down at the bottom, just ahead of the riparian buffer. But instead of doing that, we came back and revised our BMP down here uh, next to the entrance that you see. And that's a combination of really three BMPs and making an amenity and water feature with the green and all that that you can see on the plans. But what we're able to do is put the storm drains going up beside these lots. And the reason I say the only reason we did that is even these lots, one, three lots here, we, you know, I, we would like to have left the roof um, leaders and those lots, they naturally fall down the hill there and just let that disperse into the repairing buffer. Uh, with those, we're putting storm drains back in there and picking all of those up with the roof leader. So all that will be going down to the stormwater control device uh, to the south here. These lots up here, the way it's been designed, some of that area will bypass the stormwater management plan then or the stormwater control device down here at the bottom. So it is designed for that. And we've gone back and looked at alternatives. And you know the other option was to come back and have another BMP. So what we've been trying to do is make a regional BMP and get as much water in there as possible while still maintaining this natural uh, open space, natural drainage feature um, in here. Keep in mind that the area that is going to be to the east of the collector road those plans will come in and will have to do their own stormwater devices. So, and, and, and the idea is that, again, that area is going to be protected, but have a drainage easement there just to, for the town and for the people that are buying those lots. We could easily not show a drainage area, and then you come back 10 years from now, and people go down there and, you know, they're building playgrounds in there. They're doing encroaching in those areas where now you will have that easement on that, on a plat that a town can regulate that you don't have structures within that, and it is maintained and protected. So I'm curious, um, what what rights are granted in that easement, and who are they granted to? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Um, in the past, and that's totally up to the town. I think that goes to legal and how the town staff and how the town wants to. Uh, record and regulate that. Um, in the past, we've gone back and forth. A lot of municipalities have different opinions. Um, you know, a lot of them want to designate what's private, what's public. Well, we personally, what I like to do is just call it storm drainage easement. And then, uh, rather than calling it private or public, and what you can do, it's you know, I would say the yeah, other you have public, you know, that gives public and private. But that's really on the town to decide how you want to call these out. I mean, and so we're open for discussion on that. Um, the idea is that you just make sure you have something dedicated on a plat that is called out so that it does give one and protects the lots and homeowners from developing in there. And then it gives, like you're saying, access for the public or the private to get in there and maintain that if need be. And we and then that's the thing about it. Some you know, and I would agree that some places will look at that and say, Well, you've got a road that's gonna discharge to those areas. So again that's it's, you know, we look at it both ways. Uh, it's really up to the town to decide how you want to call that out. What would be the land cover? Excuse the me. land cover on that uh, storm drainage easement? It will remain, the idea is when we, is to remain as it is. The only thing we're proposing, what we'd like to do, we've done a plus study for this area in here, so you've looked at it. And it's just a local, and it's not like you know, it's a state or anything like that. We looked at a local, the the build out upstream here, uh, looking at the ultimate flows of water coming out through here, and what we were proposing is to keep that wooded, keep it as is. But then on the back of these lots, 
is that you, we may have to go in there and provide, and we're, we've already provided minimum finished floor elevations in case they want to do any basement stuff. I mean, it's just good engineering practice. Uh, a lot of places don't do that. It's just we've gone in there and done that. So um, that area would remain wooded. And then the idea is that the lots, you would make sure that the lots either meet that minimum finished floor elevation. And again, this is just people basements. It's not like the word, uh, it's just a natural draw down there. So, um, and then you may grade at the rear of those lots and as needed to bring up the rear of their, you know, the, the backyard, you might say, to stay out of, to keep it above the 100 year elevation rather than just saying, okay, it is what it is. We've already looked at it, what it would be and what a 100 year elevation might look like in there. So that range even will remain uh, undisturbed. And, and we're trying to minimize it. If we do anything in there, it's going to be select. Great. Because we walk in, we want to preserve that. I'm confused, uh, Robbie. You said if you would like it to remain with it, yes. then you're bringing in a discussion of grading. Would that mean the grading would move into the Drainage easement that, that fill would be created in there? No, the, it's, if you look at, you can't see with the topo, there's areas that may meander in and out of there. So I would say the majority of that will remain undisturbed. What we're proposing is anything, if we need to do any grade there, will be on the rear of the lot, not within that easement. So some of the spaces are not necessarily below, they're, they're storm drainage easement, but they're not necessarily downhill. Yeah, all that, that area that you see, that's, that's all that, that's, that is all down here. There's a natural drainage yeah. area through there. And the reason the width is because, you know, as you can imagine, some of those places, you know, are wider. It's not, you know, what is wider than the other. So we, it's, we could put a 20 foot in there, meander in there, but we're being, <coughs> trying to be a little bit conservative in that and, and provide a 40 or 45 foot easement in there. So, so is there something on the plan that's going to demark this easement as, an undisturbed area and that the lot owner knows they cannot disturb that area? It will be called out as an easement that you just mentioned earlier as a you know drainage and access easement. Uh, as far as being undisturbed, you still allow to go in there and probably do something in regards to the owner's going to own the lot. Right. right. The full extent of the lot. Right. He just has to be aware that his neighbors Stormwater is going to drain through his lot mm -hmm. in that location, and that's all it is. Right. So they they can cut down the tree that they wanted to. It's not like they were cutting down the tree. Page 2.5 looks like that's the intention. Tree cover area plan. Yeah. We well, might get chapter. We can go through that discussion. Two different things when you get into start getting into tree coverage area. That is protected um, tree coverage area that is regulated and maintained that will be tracked and it stays underserved. There's going to be plenty of areas in Chatham Park just like this that will remain undisturbed and have tree canopy area, but it still allows because and one of the reasons is that is that in Chatham Park element in the current element tree coverage is not allowed on uh, private lots. So that's that's one of the reasons is, you know, ideally we would take credit for that, but we're not trying to take credit for that as tree coverage area. Even though when you look at this, you know, five years from now, it will be tree canopy. Okay, Goes where it's supposed to go. 
And I would add most places wouldn't even identify that as a drain juice. But I, I will say that that's good planning, good engineer to identify it now, have it on the plan. Most places that you have around town or even, I'm not saying old buildings, even newer plans, they would not identify that. So it's a, we've looked at it and we're trying to identify and do a good job of planning engineering and to protect the town and the citizens in the future that we identify that and have it on the recorded plat. That's a big swap. Yeah. Thanks. 
then, and we want to get that graded so you can, you, you know, is the, is the car then three feet below their uh, floor elevation? Is it three feet above their floor elevation? What exactly or how that can be impacted? And then we make the determination. So it is a, a phasing step by step approach to addressing the issue. Our preference is not to take the trees out of the park. I appreciate that. I had the same question. Uh, what is the width on that back buffer on that property? On that tree preservation? On the back of a Julianne? That's what I did. This width. The closest point right here at the corner, Jay. Yeah, right here. No, the the corner and right going here. back to going back uh, east. Okay. This. Uh huh. That. Well. You know what things like doing? Right there, you go. Yeah. Okay. Well, starting here, I'll answer that first. Okay. This is roughly 40 to 45 feet from that corner to the back of curve. Okay. So that would be to the back of curve. And I was looking at the road grade. Um, and then to the sidewalk, I think it would be roughly 30 feet. Um, I guess I'm, I'm talking about the width. I'm looking on the uh, street protection. The width on the back of the property of Julianne. That's the way I'm looking at it on, for the tree preservation area. Yep. What is the width? I'm just curious what that width is there. That width there, you've got an area that is, and that, that's going to be on the daily site plan. That's what, um, that's, you know, not, that's coming for you soon. Um, but that width there, you're looking at, I'm going to scale it up. Between the total green area, Mr. Farrow, is, is about 50 feet. Okay. So it may be more than that, maybe 60, but that's, that's where I'm going to Okay, Brad, do you understand what the gentlemen are saying here with respect to the impact on your property? I have understood for over a year, and Mr. Smith and Mr. Rose have um, laid out a plan and showed me and my neighbor. and. Um, I'm understanding that the, I'm the closest, I'm, I'm the person up on the corner, he said, if I'm interested. And between the end of their sidewalk and the beginning of my little quarter acre, there's 15 feet. And, and Mr. Smith agreed that, was that at the planning meeting. And I'm not, they're not changing the road, and um, that's the way it is. They're also willing to do berming or We don't want to berm. I mean, what my neighbor once talked about a berm, and I understand that he's right, that creating a berm would just tear up more property and more land and more trees. And, I mean, I, I don't really think anybody wants a berm. Okay. As we said, we're just walls. just Kathy Mabel wanted a berm. She is going to come to meetings and So, I want a fence. I want a Okay. Well, we're going to be there with you the whole time. And, and I want to know, when the road is built, will the construction for the Thales Academy go up that road also? It has no other way to get there. Well, yeah, that's what I thought. So it's not just a road behind me. It's a big construction thing. So I want my fence. <laughs> it sounds like Chuck is willing to do that. Thank you very much. What? I just wanted to make sure that, that you were feeling satisfied. I understand, and I think that Mr. Smith is very happy to work with me. I don't, I'm not happy that it's going to be 15 well, feet, and from the edge of my property, there's only 25 feet to my back steps. So it's real close, and I don't have much property. But um, I'll just have to see what happens next. Thank you. Were there further questions from the board regarding some of the uh, aspects of the engineering? Yeah. 
I did receive uh, additional correspondence in recognizing that that would be uh, uh, not relevant to uh, quasi judicial proceeding. I would like to ask if Megan would be willing to ask if there's additional public comment that might come forward at this moment. Because I public thought that close. someone might come. Neighbors. Is that agreeable? That's, that's correct. And if, if that's going to be the case, then I need a motion to go back into public hearing with respect to this particular special use permit. Well, I believe we didn't close it, but I think that we would need to authorize the continuance for Mr. Messick. Are you not? Yes, I thought you were on the right track. Yeah. Is there a motion? So moved. Second. Moved by John Bonnet, seconded by Beth Wilson Foley. Those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed. Is there anyone that cares to speak with respect to this special use permit that did not speak at the prior uh, meetings of this board on this issue? Hearing none, then, is there a motion to close the public hearing? So moved. Second. Moved by Michael Fiocco, seconded by John Bonnet. Those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed. Thank you. The motion carries. Um, were there any additional questions for Victoria or uh, is the applicant here? Thank you. Mm -hmm. I don't have a question, but thank you for providing this so that we can see where you want to put the pen. Playground, the tree, golf bag. Thank you. And I'd like to thank the board and the uh, uh, and the town planner with respect to the kindness that's extended to you as someone who's trying to develop a small business um, and the idea that that we wanted to prevent you from having to hire massive amounts of engineers and all of that kind of thing. Um, I've been told as well that uh, that the licensing system will make sure that all of those aspects are are relatively well taken care of. It's very well. Taken care of. Thank you. Is there a motion? I'd like to make a motion that we approve the special use permit SCP-2017-03 for Little Pike Learning Activity. Thank you. Moved by that one from Foley, seconded by Pamela Baldwin. Those in favor, please keep by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed. Motion carried. <coughs> Next matter is the proposed annexation of Chatham Park near Fire Tower Road in Tompkins. <coughs> Planner Jeff Jones is with us to. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this is the continuation of the annexation public hearing. Uh, we had that on October. Um, August 14th, um, and this is for you to decide whether to annex 108.887 acres. Um, this area also includes that Thompson Street subdivision that you just. Uh, I know the time, the the, the the timing is a little off. We should have the annex annexation first, and uh, we'll get that uh, situated in future endeavors. Uh, but you have had the public hearing, as I mentioned, on August 14th. There was no speakers at that uh, public hearing, and it has met the sufficiency uh, as determined by the town board. Are there questions for Jeff Jones or the owner applicant? Moved by Michael Fierro, seconded by Jay Carroll. Those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed. Motion carried. Thank you. Our next item is old business number three, proposed annexation of the remand property at the Monture uh, Pittsburgh Road. Yes, uh, thank you, Mayor. This uh, is a public hearing that was held on August 28th to consider the annexation request for 20.303 acres. Its location is 270 Pittsburgh Monture Road. It's uh, historically known as the uh, Old Townsend Chicken Plant. Um, it is under review currently for an upfit to a uh, concrete facility and storage facility. Um, the property owner 
would like to have you all consider the annexation, even though the uh, planning board tabled the item because there was no representation from the applicant or their engineers at the planning board meeting, so the planning board cannot ask questions pertaining to the site plan that was under review. So I have spoken to the property owner uh, and his uh, representatives, and he's okay moving forward with the annexation if you all are. If not, we can table it or can continue this to another other time. They're really not connected, unless you all think they are. Okay. They're not connected. Right. Right. What, what are Annexation and the site plan. The site plan is done, and this is something else. And he's taking a chance that we will approve the site plan. Yeah, and, and, and even if you don't, it's still annexed if you go forward. So that, was, that was discussed. As, you know, I typically, if that, if that was going to happen, I would give the applicant the opportunity to pull back. I was actually surprised. I said, no, just go ahead and move forward. Mm -hmm. It's okay. So uh, take that for what it's worth, and it's your decision to make. Well, um, prior to this conversation and exchange, uh, I had concerns about this. Uh, I spoke with one member of the planning board, and uh, that person was surprised that the, the party didn't, didn't show, um, and it was communicated to me that, that there were questions on the board. Um, and I guess since we have the chairman of the planning board here, I wonder if he might uh, be willing to answer the question, does he have a sense, Mr. Rafer Bland, do you have a sense of um, were any of those questions articulated, or was it just a statement of, yeah, I wish he had been here because I had some questions? That's most uh, likely that there were, uh, everybody knows the place, and we were, of course, looking and saw all of the drawings, uh, noticed a whole slew of encroachments and such stuff as that, which have been going on for years. Um, and we were looking out saying, you know, we've got some questions. Is there, is there someone we could discuss this with here? And no one was there. And by that time, uh, the whole room was almost empty. Uh, and Mr. Jones said, well, they were supposed to be here. Well, I talked to them. They said they were coming or something like that. They were aware that we had this meeting tonight and they were expected to be here to, to have this discussion. So there were no specific questions brought up, but but the whole board was uh, anxious to make inquiry and do a decent study, and we weren't able to. Is that, does that, uh, thank you. Sure. And do I understand that was with respect to the site plan? Secondly? Yes. Okay. yes. But this is a separate issue. Yeah. Yes. The annexation. Okay. And I believe we've already provided an allocation <coughs> of sewer. Mm -hmm. to this property. Yes, a small allocation for the office. So. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. Will be approved the annotation. Moved by Michael Piotrowski, seconded by Jay Farrell. Those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, thank you. I'm gathering that our discussion of the water shortage management <coughs> with um, with our engineer Fred Boyle is not going to go forward. No, it's not. I mean. It's the same document that we reviewed before. Yes. We made, as I indicated in my memo, we made the changes. So if you have any other changes, we'd like to recommend it. Um, great. Uh, if not, I don't think Fred's absence, unfortunate absence tonight, but necessarily. Okay. I've, got, I've got some questions. Um, I'm very Triggers. The headings triggers. Caught my eye. The stage three says water usage exceeds 100 percent. I have a figure of 1.8 million gallons a day. And I've always 
Council understood the capacity was two million gallons a day. So just curious to get my figures correct. Is it 1.8 or is it two? I think it's permitted for two, but they backwash, and I don't think they can produce more than 1.8. Okay. It's just my recollection. Okay. Now, the other question I have has to do with um, water usage exceeding 80% of the town's water production capacity. And I'm wondering how is production of 80% of the capacity, how does that constitute a shortage? It sounds like a lot of water. Is it an indication that at that production level you're at risk of being unable to sustain that production level? And therefore, there is a potential shortage and we should uh, induce people to cut down on their usage? You're talking about the stage one voluntary? Yeah. 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 I mean, it really applies for most. You know, if we're producing the water, then I don't know that there's a shortage unless that amount of water doesn't provide enough water. Yeah, I think there has to be a threshold somewhere. And I don't know if it's the production, it's the work production. We're talking about temporary shortages. Mm -hmm. We are producing that kind of volume. Where is the indication that it's indicative of a shortage? I, mean, I'm just, I know there's logic here, but I I, I don't understand it. So, so I will leave that open for consideration. Um, and then corollary to when we've got a shortage and we're in mandatory reductions, I think it starts at stage three mandatory reductions. The rate for using the water has a multiplier on it. So now it costs 1.5 times the dollar to use a gallon of water. And I'm wondering what the rationale is for increasing the cost. As an incentive to reduce your usage. If it costs more, you should use less. And you will, and we will penalize you for doing that. Absolutely. In addition to charging you extra. Absolutely. No, that's the penalty, is the extra. So, if you meet the percentage reduction, then you don't get charged the extra. You get charged that extra for every gallon you go over the stated goal, reduction goal. Or do I get charged that for every gallon I use? written, it means all the water you use. Yeah. yeah. So even if I meet the stated goal of a 20% reduction, I'm still going to get charged extra. I don't see how that's an incentive. You're not in violation then. Huh? You're not in violation. No. Well, if you're not in violation, you're not going to get charged a surcharge. Oh. So? Surcharge is for violators, not normal. So if I don't use, if I reduce my usage by 20%, I get the regular rate. Yes, I don't know how we're going to So for every right gallon off. over that, I no, get charged extra. No, not every gallon over that. All of your gallons, if you're over. Ah, uh, I see. Oh, okay. So if you're a violator, you're using more than you're supposed to. Okay. So therefore, you should pay the penalty. And in addition to this $500 charge and this $1,000 charge, Yes, 
Absolutely. Yeah. Board is important. Oh, good. So what we're asking you to do tonight is, is to kind of merely accept this plan. It's still in a comment period, as you can see. So at the next meeting, we'll note, we'll note these comments. Um, you guys can think of anything else that you'd like to add at this time. Um, please um, let us know, and then we'll have another whack at it. Yes, sir. I do have a question uh, regarding the stage one at uh, the five level water shortage response. Are those consistent with what the state considers a stage one as well? Because when there was a water shortage, people were very confused. That's been a number of years ago, and they were saying this is a stage one. That's what we want everyone to do. And nobody knew what stage one meant. So each city had a different idea of what stage one was. So I don't know if this is what the state considers stage one. They should not be filed, you know, not triggered or anything, but is that consistent with what the state the Yeah, the draft ordinance was developed uh, in, with, with, from, with state input. Okay. So. Randy, uh, did you have a... Just a quick question. How does it account for amount of water loss in the system, which I know we've been working on for years, so if we produce 2 million gallons, theoretically, and if we lost 30% because of leach and other things, and I know they're trying to drive that number down, how does that weigh into this? You understand what I'm saying, Mike? Yeah. 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 So that we can theoretically kick ourselves into it because water's actually not getting us a customer, but it's, you know, we're producing it, but they're not using it. The policy addresses usage, not capacity. If the usage is over the limit, then it triggers these various things. So it's incumbent on the town to determine what its usage of the customers are, not what it produces. But it's based on 80% of the town's water. That's because we're using a river for a water supply. If we had a lake that was finite in terms of volume, it would be easier to see uh, when the mandatory uh, the stages came in, so we had to have some kind of trigger to start the whole process. So, using the 80% of production is the easier way. It's the only way the town can do it because the river is going to presumably is going to keep on flowing. Um, Would that change if we went to the Jordan Lake Partnership? I assume. Well, I think that's a question. That's a down the road, down the river question. Managers update. Unless there are other concerns about the water shortage. <laughs> 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 Thank, you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, New Town Hall. We um, we uh, have uh, again uh, been scoring the uh, the submitted proposals. Uh, for needs assessment, space needs assessment, and building design. Uh, I had anticipated doing those with you tonight. Uh, one of the primary consultants that we're looking at is, is out of town uh, this week, so, uh, so I'm holding off until the 25th. But you can see here, as I, I kind of mentioned a little bit uh, at the last meeting, some of the evaluation criteria that, uh, that uh, I'm applying towards the solar zone disinformation was, was outlined in the RFQ. Uh, among uh, a list of other information that was required to be submitted. Uh, so, uh, looking forward to uh, recommending um, uh, a consultant to negotiate a contract at the next uh, at the next meeting. Uh, other information: um, the uh, electrical vehicles charging stations. I'm looking forward to having a uh, potential consultant this week. Again, we received one proposal. Uh, I think um, just that just to get a feel, I think for what uh, this this proposal is is recommending and some of the concepts that they might have in mind. I think uh, a good starting point would, would be for uh, me to interview the consultant as as outlined in RFQ. Uh, you can see here uh, one of the things in the kind of interesting um, the. Um, 
they had applied this actually to the town hall. You recall we had four different locations, four different potential locations for electric vehicle charging stations. Um, one of the locations was town hall. Um, this, of course, is a town hall. I think they confused the administration building the county with town hall. But I kind of wanted to provide an outline with uh, uh, or kind of a, a visual for what they would be proposing uh, and how you know, how it would be going in and how how the uh, hardware and the infrastructure would be connected in this case. So uh, anyway, it's really interesting. I like you know kind of tackling projects that I don't I don't honestly have a lot of familiarity with, so this is gonna be fun as we move forward. Uh, this isn't gonna be a design that you're gonna see moving forward unless the county moves ahead with an electrical vehicle charging station at this particular location. As you can see they have an idea for it. Uh, so I'm gonna come on that. Um, Okay, uh, we will need to circle back with you on the force main guarantee. We, um, we have had Davenport go back and recalculate uh, some numbers with Wooten uh, in terms of squaring away projections on the force main guarantee with Chad Park. Um, we do need to get that uh, in front of you and uh, we'll be circling back with you on how we're going to be going about that. Um, the RF, Chatham County, uh, I mentioned last week, um, has also had an RFQ out for the area of property that they have adjacent to the current uh, administrative building, which includes uh, you know, what they call the government annex, the old ag building, the Dunlap building. Um, so we're finalizing a consultant selection on that this week. Um, East Corn Wall Street um, has more discussions with DOT on that. And, um, I, we need to outline uh, a couple of options on that. Essentially, what uh, what what I'm finding out from DOT, apparently the the efforts to pave that stretch of East Corn Wallace Road predate me and go back a little bit, um, and they've, apparently the town has taken a couple of stabs at it in the past. Um, the uh, DOT has has gone at us um, and actually obtained years ago obtained some information from property owners. Uh, they found that uh, a couple of a couple of the properties have uh, have some some objects and flagstones and things like that in there, which kind of caused the halt. Also, too, that they would have they would be requiring before DOT would pay that they would be requiring that water and sewer uh, be relocated from underneath the road. Um, so I'm not saying it's impossible, but at least in, in so far as DOT paving it. Um, it looks like there are some challenges there. They did say that they would relinquish, relinquish control of the road um, to the town. They'd be willing to do that if the town would be willing to a, accept it and b pay the road. So, um, I'm going to have some more discussions. Come back to you, I think, with with kind of a clear outline of some of our options on that. Um, so, there's a worst case scenario that if you're willing to tackle it, we would have to we would have to accept the road. Uh, Worked out uh, a means of, of paving that road, uh, which would probably be the least intrusive um, for the neighboring property owners, and at least for how the utilities are currently situated um, on that stretch. So, more fun, and the fun continues. Um, uh, auditors were here um, uh, last week. Uh, they're out. Uh, they always finish a lot quicker. And they say I think they're supposed to be out by Thursday, and they were out by Wednesday. So, um, so that that moved uh, that moved along well. Uh, as Commissioner Baldwin, uh, Mayor Pro Tem Baldwin, indicated, the Affordable Housing uh, Advisory Committee uh, is requesting a representative, um, and they've posted an ad for applicants uh, that would be due by September 18th. So if, if, at all, if it's at all possible, if you guys could decide tonight to maybe talk Pamela into it, uh, I think that would be the ideal situation. Um, but that's purely between you guys. So, um, and I can certainly process that application information. Um, <coughs> so. uh, the committee, um, of course, you recall the Affordable Rental Housing Committee um, had a report we had anticipated reviewing that report with you this evening. 
Um, I believe that um, I didn't believe it was, I guess, necessary at this juncture, given the amount of information that we had on the agenda tonight, and maybe the amount of discussion would need to take place around it. So we're going to reserve and look at uh, having that presentation at the coming meeting. From their standpoint, that the I, I should say, from Triangle J standpoint. And from the advisory committee standpoint, the important thing I think is is to uh, appoint a representative uh, or to have a representative. Uh, I've also included some reminders in there about the additional elements workshop dates on September 21st and October 5th, and again until we hear otherwise, those are at Chatham Park, the Chatham Park offices, um, and those are Group Two and Group Three elements on two different dates. Also, too, coming up on the horizon is uh, is our annual meeting um, with the Chatham Economic Development um, Corporation Opportunity Chatham, uh, October 20th, and that will this year be at the County Ag Center, uh, October 20th from 7:30 a.m. to 10 a.m. You'll recall that in previous years we the town has reserved a table, uh, and I'm willing to do that again unless. Uh, the board feels it's not necessary, so unless I hear otherwise, I'm just going to go ahead and reserve the table, uh, and then I'll give you more details. Um, I've said something we've done in the past, so I think we should continue to do that. Yeah. And then, uh, upcoming meetings, of course, this is this is going to change a little bit after tonight. We've got a couple of things on the agenda tonight, and so, uh, again, these, these things aren't etched in stone, but... Uh, Give you kind of a roadmap of where I think we might be heading. So, with that, I would tap out. The clean sex cluster was coming in October. Previous meetings, uh, <coughs> there is a master. They're they're taking qualifications from firms to help with uh, help to find a master plan for that property that I described uh, adjacent to the, the current attics and the old ag building and the Dunlop building. So it's really kind of I mean they have some con they have some concepts that they've informally thrown at the walls, but they haven't had any real professional sussing out of, of how that's going to be. And that impacts us because it's in our downtown. Okay, I, I didn't know that it impacted the use of of the potential town hall. Um, Not to my knowledge. Okay. Yeah, they they were the board, the county board, as I indicated previously. The county board was was adamant that the town be involved in this process, and so I kind of backed into it. So. I'm sure there'll be more opportunities for discussion on this in the forum. I'm curious about the connectivity between our town hall and that property. But as far as locating a town hall and that property, no. I mean, we don't. No, I know. The rent area is the two floors. Sure. I'm kind of curious that, uh, and wonder what the board thoughts are about the uh, evaluation criteria for it and the architect. I'd really like to see a local firm that I really appreciate you bringing that up because I'm a strong proponent of, of uh, um, supporting local businesses mm -hmm. and um, driving the local economy um, with our tax dollars, but um, in this case, I, 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 uh, I feel like um, this is going to be an outpost kind of on the future. It's a really big project, and the uh, efficiency and cost of ownership of that structure very much concerns me. In fact, it concerns me more than keeping the dollars local. And if it's a firm that 
is from out of town but happens to have greater expertise, um, more importantly, greater track record and history of energy efficiency, planning, design, architecture, uh, I'd really like to see that articulated uh, in the objectives. And um, so, yeah. We do have a very qualified. <coughs> we do. Well, I, I, I agree that uh, weighting the local is important, and I think it's as high as any other criteria. It's, I think it's probably. You know, I, I can I can assure Commissioner Bonnets as well that that all all of the firms that um, that I've reviewed at this point all express familiarity with LEED. And that was something that um, some I had requested that that information be put forward um, LEED and, and sustainable design and you know things of that nature. Um, I think I've been completely expressed in the proposals that I've, I've seen at this point. So okay. that's going to be important. Okay. I appreciate that. And as we said in our last exchange two weeks ago, it's, it's less important that it be the more important that it be the track record of the, uh, the integral nature of early design decisions on the performance of the building long term. So. Actually, I'd like to see that the structure is in keeping with the other architecture in Pittsburgh and keeps with the, the spirit of the community. And I was very excited, actually, uh, Manager Cruz, but I, that I think that in one of your prior presentations, you had indicated some time and space for public input that would might lead us in the direction of that kind of sentiment. Commissioner Foley has expressed it. Thank you. It has to be owned by the community. It's, it's a public building. I think this is very important. It's not, you know, we're looking at this, or I'm looking at this in two ways. On one hand, we have an organization right now, a $4 million organization, that at some point in time will be a $16 million plus organization. And I, I can't attract and retain talent to that organization by building haphazard offices over in Chatham Mills. I'm going to flat out fight that right now. So. It's something that we have to have that's centered in the downtown, in the community, that we can all be proud of. I agree. We get one shot at this. I also thank you for the updates on the upcoming events. There have been uh, several emails and several comments from folks this past week about the fact that none of us had shown up at the Chamber of Commerce event last week and that none of us had shown up at the 9-11 ceremony on Saturday, neither of which did I know was, was happening. And um, Michael, I don't I think you, that you didn't. Anyway, it's important for us to receive from you, the staff, and from you, the public, events that, you, that, that we need to be at. And, um, yeah, I, wasn't, I wasn't aware that you guys were waiting I mean, for that information. Well, I don't, I'm not ordinarily, but okay. the, um, the October 20th thing that, that you talked about here, yeah. um, is obviously. We, we do that, every, yeah, that's something we do every year. But, um, but it's, uh, it's regrettable that we did not know about the chamber event this past week. Um, usually, Cindy Poindexter keeps us all very well apprised of things that are happening, but. I didn't, I didn't get any. I looked back as my opening. I can, and that's something that we can. I can work with Cindy on and make sure that we we do that. I wasn't aware that we had received that information. I, I thought the 9/11 event was beyond 9/11, but it wasn't. So. But there was there was a discussion about the fact that none of us were there. Well. Um, Commissioner Concerns, Jason Allen? Oh, that is. I did know about the 9-11 when I was out of town. Um, and I guess I should have passed the word on. So I did work up there about half the day Tuesday. We did a lot of cleaning up in the area and all that. That was my fault. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, Commissioner Allen? Yes. Um, I've 
approached by several people who are very concerned about that there is a word that a sheet gas station is going to be built right next to small, which is a bed and breakfast. Um, I, was, I informed them that I would find out more about it. I just wondered if that's something that the staff has seen that we haven't heard about yet. Nothing's been submitted to that okay. property, but okay. it could. Won't be a sheets. And the sheets is kind of, I don't know where that started. Right, it won't be a sheets. That would impact the business. That would impact the impression of having a gas station. Right. Well, I didn't say it wouldn't be a gas station. It wouldn't be sheets. It, would, it wouldn't be the, the big red flashing. Or is it a cruiser? No. Michael, um, I'm curious, did, did we lose the lights in the trees? I'm trying to find out what happened. Uh, really? I had asked, I anticipated that very question from I drove Steve by. Um, yeah. Um, oh. yeah, I uh, texted, texted John on Friday about that. I didn't, didn't have an opportunity to talk to him. Okay. I know the tree service was trimming the trees over the holiday weekend. They may not yeah. have gone back up yet. Because I, I, I provide them some supplies to block off the parking so they could do it on the holiday. So it may just be the delay on them getting back to it. Um, I'm just uh, it's excited that we're going to have some really meaningful work sessions on the additional elements that we've been studying and working through and struggling with. And so I'm looking forward to all of us being able to sit down in the room our thinking, our thoughts, our interpretation, our processing of the information. So let us all be, be ready and make it a very fruitful day. Excellent. So while we're discussing that, I was thinking that this being a work session, it needed to be up. Um, but um, what does the board feel about outside speakers or the contributions of other persons? Who, uh, Ron Grusbeck is shaking his head. I believe that that's been our policy in the past. Since when we have a work session, we work. There's no difference. Then there's no difference from just doing the same thing at a public meeting and inviting. Yeah. I mean. <coughs> so that's what we'll do. There, people. It's a public meeting. People can attend it. Yeah. The discussion should be kept among you and, and other stakeholders. And we did discuss at a previous meeting about having people from the city here on in case questions arise. Yeah, I'm giving the length of her presentation tonight and the documents. I'm wondering if we if, if that's that's uh, we heard it in 2015, we heard it again tonight. Well, I think if she wants to attend, she wants to attend. Oh, she certainly does. Oh, she wants to attend, absolutely. But I don't think she needs to count on being a speaker. I don't think she needs to. Okay, all right, okay. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Is there a request? Okay. Yes. Okay. Hello? No, I don't have anything. Thank you. Uh, in that case, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. 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 Second.